Hello, and welcome to Lessons Learned Live. Today I'm in the engine control room of the Explorer of the Seas, and our subject is engine room fires. We're going to look at two real events. One, the engine room fire on the Nordic Empress in June of 2001. And the other, the engine room fire here on the Explorer of the Seas in May of 2002. Two almost identical events in terms of the way they got started. However, the outcomes, as you'll see, were entirely different. Fortunately, in both cases, there were no injuries to passengers or crew. However, in the case of the Nordic Empress, the ship had to sound the emergency signal, and as an aftermath of the fire, the ship was taken out of service for two weeks. In the case of the Explorer of the Seas, they had to go to Bravo, but not to an emergency signal, and the whole event was over in under a minute. The repairs that required, a $500 sensor had to be replaced, everything else to be cleaned up with rags and soap and water. We're going to try now to take you back to what happened on the Nordic Empress in June of 2001, to show you what went right and also to show you what the lessons learned were. Then we'll talk about how the company reacted, the investments that were made, the training that was conducted, that allowed the Explorer of the Seas, just a few months later, to have a very similar situation and a much more positive outcome. On June 16, 2001, at 5.30 in the morning, the Nordic Empress, with 2,213 passengers and crew, was disabled 140 miles north of Bermuda, following an engine room fire. The fire was so intense that the captain quickly sounded the emergency signal, and the ship's emergency plans were activated. Fortunately, no passengers or crew were injured due to the professional action taken by the captain and crew. The ship did, however, suffer extensive engine room damage that resulted in the ship being taken out of service for two weeks. You can see some of the damage in these images. The subsequent investigation found that a bolt on a fuel line flange failed, resulting in fuel being released onto hot engine surfaces, causing an explosive fire. As you saw, the damage to the engine room was significant. The ship maintained power to the accommodation areas during the entire event and was able to return to Bermuda on her own, although with reduced power. Let's now take a step-by-step -step look at the Nordic Empress fire. The investigation showed that the fuel line had been welded on previously. Improper bolts had been used and the tightening was not sufficient, and the original modification was not properly done. The flange assembly was not in compliance with the technical bulletin. The bolts in the flange break, the flange then separates, and low-pressure fuel alarms are received immediately in the engine control room. Fuel spray hits the hot engine surfaces, the fuel ignites, and you have a fire, an explosive fire. And this starts the timing of our sequence. The fire was observed on closed-circuit television from the control room, and the bridge received an electronica alarm. At 30 seconds, the bridge sounded bravo, bravo, bravo. Two minutes into the fire, the engines were stopped as well as the fuel pumps. For the next three to five minutes, attempts were made to enter the engine spaces and fight the fire with fire hoses. The engine spaces were found out to be too hot. Six minutes into the fire, the water mist system was released and the ship's emergency signal was sounded. After approximately 10 minutes, the fire appears to be extinguished. At 22 minutes, the space was re-entered Eight minutes later, a flashback was experienced. This flashback was relatively quickly extinguished by crew using hoses. For the next hour and 39 minutes, the engine room and adjoining compartments were carefully inspected. At the end of this inspection, burning cables were detected. The space was immediately evacuated, watertight doors were closed, and 885 kilos of halon were released. Approximately four minutes after releasing the halon, the water mist system was again reactivated. Nineteen minutes later, the space was re-entered, and two hours and fifty-nine minutes after the fire first started, the fire was logged as extinguished. Let's now look at the costs associated with the Nordic Empress fire. The wet docking and repairs, two and a half million dollars. Travel agent commissions, six hundred and ninety-one thousand dollars. Hotel, charter planes and the like, eight hundred thousand dollars. Future cruise vouchers, $4,100,000. In two weeks of lost onboard revenue, $725,000. 
a grand total of $8,816,000 directly related to the fire in the engine room of the Nordic Empress. Let's now take a look at the lessons learned from the Nordic Empress fire. First of all, lessons learned are not always bad things. They can be good, and there's a couple good ones here. The captain and crew did an outstanding job in handling the critical emergency situation in offshore conditions. The ship's emergency plans and training worked. Engine fuel pumps and ventilation must be shut down immediately. Water mist systems must be released as soon as possible. Water mist systems must cover the entire engine compartment. And standard operating procedures and training must be modified to reflect all of the above. The important thing with lessons learned is to take action. And action was taken, and a lot of it, after the fire. A quick closing valve project was established for fuel lines. New, more efficient and improved water mist extinguishing systems, high fog, to the megaships and to Nordic Empress. Fleet-wide enhancements to the water mist systems already installed. Improvement of fire detection systems in the machinery spaces. Improvement of closed-circuit television camera systems in the machinery spaces. Integration of closed-circuit TV and the fire detection system. Enhanced standard operating procedures and training based on the lessons learned. In total, over $3.8 million in upgrades. Now let's take a close look at the engine room fire on the Explorer of the Seas. Diesel generator number six. The engine room of the Explorer of the Seas. This is where it all happened. Let's see exactly where it happened. Right inside here, this is where you have the plug that blew out. It's this one inch plug right there, popped out, behind it, seven and a half bar, 120 degrees Celsius fuel, started gushing out. What did it hit? It hit a red hot engine. What was around it? Plenty of air, oxygen provided by the ventilation system. The three sides of the fire triangle. The result, an explosive fire. The investigation after the fire showed that there had been insufficient tightening torque on the erosion plug on diesel generator number six. The one inch erosion plug on the fuel pump blew out. A low fuel pressure alarm was immediately received in the engine control room at the same time as hot fuel was hitting the hot engine surfaces. The fuel ignited and we had our explosive fire that you've seen in the video. Our timer starts here. Five seconds later, the fire was observed in the closed-circuit television system in the control room. Seven seconds later, the engineers stopped the engine and the fuel pumps. Three seconds after that, the high-fog water mist system was released. At 20 seconds into the event, the Bravo, Bravo, Bravo signal was sounded from the bridge. Fifty seconds after the fire first ignited, it appeared to be extinguished from the closed-circuit television monitors. Four minutes after that, the space was again entered. And five minutes after the initial fire was detected, the fire was confirmed extinguished. As you can clearly see, the sequence of events on the Explorer of the Seas resulted in an entirely different situation than what transpired in the Nordic Empress. Let's now take a look at the costs associated with the Explorer of the Seas fire. Well, there's not a lot to look at. There was a sensor replacement required, $500. And that was the total cost of the entire event. Even though almost everything apparently went well with the Explorer of the Seas fire, there are still some lessons learned. Let's look at them. Well, the first lesson learned was that the lessons learned from the Nordic Empress worked. The fire safety project investments paid off, the enhanced standard operating procedures paid off, and the training for the duty engineers clearly paid off. There were, however, a couple of things that we could still improve on. We found out that the erosion plug was tightened with a wrench. No torque meter was used. And a Wartzilla torque recommendation for tightening of the erosion plug was not followed. Let's now look at the action taken after the Explorer of the Seas fire. A fleet-wide check of erosion plug tightening torques was conducted. A new work permit for pressurized fuel systems was established. Wartzilla was requested to provide a summary page on all service bulletins. And we produced this video 
hopefully an effective means of showing all of you the events that transpired on the Nordic Empress and the Explorer of the Seas, and the positive lessons learned that we've gained. We've already shown you that one of the steps taken after the Nordic Empress fire was to improve the coverage of closed-circuit television cameras. As a result, we're able to now show you the exact surveillance video that captured the Explorer of the Seas fire. Let me set the stage for you. The camera position is located on the deck above the engines. The engine closest to us is diesel generator number six, and that's where we had the fire. It's interesting to note that there's a crew member with his back to the camera working on the engine next to number six. And fortunately, he was not hurt in the explosion you're soon going to see. If you look closely, you can just see the first small traces of smoke rising from diesel generator number six. You'll also be able to see that the crew member in the background will soon become aware of the smoke and will turn and face the camera. And there you have it, an explosive fire. The clock's now ticking and things are happening as you know in the engine control room. But as you'll see, very shortly, they will have released the high fog system. And you'll be able to clearly see the discharge from the top portion of your screen. And here it comes. As you'll see, the fire is quickly knocked down, but the high fog system remains on even after the fire appears to be out. As you can see, the fire is still flashing up. And that flash up right there is the last one we're going to see. And right about now, it appears to be out from the position of the closed circuit television camera. By the way, there's a light in the background, a little bit to the right of center, kind of yellowish right there. Uh, that's a light, that's not fire. Now let's jump ahead four minutes in time when the engine room is now being re-entered by crew with their breathing apparatus on. And there you have it. Five minutes after the initial explosion, the fire in the engine room of the Explorer of the Seas is confirmed extinguished. The real success story of this fire is how little damage actually took place. Today is June 8, 2002, five days after the fire. Right here, I'm at ground zero. This is where it happened. There's no damage. The cleanup was done with rags and cleaning material. There was one $500 sensor that had to be replaced. Quite remarkable, just showing how the quick reaction, cutting off of the fuel, releasing of the high fog, cutting of the ventilation, closing the watertight doors, all resulted in basically what could have been another catastrophic engine room fire being reduced to basically an event that was handled with almost no consequences after. As you have seen, advanced water mist and high fog extinguishing systems have introduced an important and extremely effective tool for combating fires on board. Let's take a moment to study the science and theory behind these systems. We are all familiar with the fire triangle, which describes the three components, fuel, oxygen, and heat, that are necessary to create the chemical reaction which produces a fire. Take away one or more of these and there's no fire. All fire extinguishing systems work by taking away one or more of these three ingredients. Halon systems are the exception and add a fourth dimension to firefighting by breaking the chain reaction. Halon chemically interrupts the combustion process by preventing the fuel, heat, and oxygen from reacting with each other. As you know, water is an effective tool in combating many types of fires. The main reason water is so good is that it's an excellent coolant. 
Water removes heat from a fire to the point that you cool the fuel to below its ignition or flash point, the point that it catches on fire. In other words, water helps you remove one side of the fire triangle, heat. With the water mist system, water is used to combat fires in two main ways. First, as with conventional firefighting with water, it removes the heat, although as you will see, much, much more efficiently. Secondly, water mist systems also inert are remove oxygen from the fire. Let's look more closely at these two processes. We'll start with the cooling. With a hose or sprinkler, water is dispersed on a fire in droplets. Each of these droplets has a surface area that is related to the droplet size. A large drop will naturally have a larger surface area than a small drop. Surface area is important because it's through the surface area that the water absorbs heat. Therefore, the more water surface area we can expose to a fire, the better and quicker the cooling effect will be. A typical sprinkler system produces droplets of water that are typically a little bit larger than one millimeter in diameter. With a water mist system, the increased system pressure and nozzle size produces water droplets with a much smaller diameter of about one-third of a millimeter. You can therefore put 40 of these droplets in the same area occupied by only one drop of sprinkler water. It is here that we find an interesting phenomena and a key to the efficiency of water mist systems. Because water mist systems produce 40 droplets of water in the same space as our one drop of sprinkler water, the combined surface area of these 40 droplets is actually 10 times that of a sprinkler droplet. Therefore, the cooling effect is also increased by a factor of 10. With a high fog water mist system, the system pressure is further increased and the water droplet size is reduced even more. In fact, high fog systems are able to produce 8,000 droplets of water in the same space as our single drop of sprinkler water. These 8,000 droplets have a combined surface area that is increased 400 times, resulting in a corresponding increase of the cooling effect by 400 times that of a traditional sprinkler system. So you can easily see how water mist systems enhance tremendously the cooling effect of water, and therefore the ability to extinguish fires quickly and using much less water. The reduced volumes of water is particularly important in accommodation fires because it limits the scope of the water damage after the fire. Another benefit of water mist systems is that they can be used effectively on all four classes of fire, even high voltage. The very small water droplet size that these mist systems produces is not a good conductor of electricity, and it will not splatter fires of flammable liquids, greases, or gases. Okay, that was the first part, cooling. Now let's look at the second way water mist systems work, by removing oxygen. You are all familiar with CO2 systems and their function. The science behind CO2 is fairly simple. CO2 is an inert gas which is heavier than air. When released in a confined space, it will fall downward by gravity and push the air upwards, eventually away from the point of combustion, effectively removing the oxygen side of the fire triangle. Something else happens when you release CO2. Because the air is pushed out of a space by the CO2, anyone in the space would not be able to breathe. So it is very important that a space is completely evacuated, with everyone accounted for before releasing CO2. And this is a process that can take time, allowing the fire, in the meantime, to grow. With water mist systems, the very small water particle size creates a condition that is very favorable for quick vaporization of the water to steam. It will typically take about one second for our single water droplet from a sprinkler system to vaporize. The 40 drops from a water mist system will only take one-tenth of a second to vaporize. And the 8,000 droplets from the high fog system, they'll be fully vaporized in a remarkable 3 milliseconds. During the vaporization process, the water volume expands as steam approximately 1,760 times. This dramatic expansion forces the air away from the point of combustion again effectively removing the oxygen side of the fire triangle. So both CO2 and water mist extinguishing systems remove oxygen from the fire. The big difference, however, between these two systems is that with CO2, oxygen is removed from the entire space, whereas with water mist systems, the oxygen is removed only at the precise point of combustion. 
therefore making it perfectly safe for humans to be in the same space where the water mist or high fog system is being released. This was a very important factor in the quick and successful extinguishing of the engine room fire on the Explorer. There was no need to delay releasing the system in order to evacuate the engine room. Another benefit of the efficient vaporization of water with a mist or high fog system is that the vaporization process itself requires heat and, as a result, contributes to the already substantial cooling effect of the water mist. The fine water mist particles also help clear smoke. This happens because the carbon particles that are created by the fire easily attach themselves to the tiny water droplets. The carbon is therefore effectively weighed down by the water and, with gravity, sinks to the deck. So there you have it, water mist and high fog extinguishing systems, a fantastic firefighting tool. They can effectively be used on most types of fires, especially electrical and flammable liquids. They're not hazardous to humans allowing immediate release. They're extremely effective as a coolant. They remove oxygen while cooling. It helps reduce smoke density. And there's much less water damage after the fire. Well, there you have it. Two examples that again show how really important lessons learned and near misses are. These are important chances for you to really extract critical information or operation from events that have happened in the past. Yeah. Pay attention to them, whether they're big or small. Discuss them. Send them shoreside. Let us look at them, analyze them, dissect them. Because then we can take that information, we can incorporate it into our procedures, we can develop better systems, and we can make sure that our operations in the future are always continually improving, becoming safer and safer for our crew, for our guests, and for our company.